Hi, I'm Kathy. I'm a part of our Women in the Word teaching team, and I am excited that I get to be here today to talk about 1 Kings chapters 5 and 6. My mom had a zero birthday this past year. It is what I like to call birthdays when the age that you're turning has a zero in it. And I think it's really fun to celebrate birthdays, even in a small way for any age, But when it's a zero birthday, like 20 or 80 or 50, I think it's fun to just do something a little extra if you can. So when I was visiting my family in South Carolina this summer, it was my mom's birthday. And so my sister, sister sister-in-law and I took her up to North Carolina to the Biltmore House, which is the largest privately owned house in the United States built in the early 1890s. It is in the area that the storms have impacted lately. I'm sure that you have been prayerful and grieved, as have I. Obviously, people matter more than things, but the Biltmore House did post that while there was some damage on their property, the house itself was largely fine. So when we went this summer, we went just for the purpose of enjoying the house. We went to look at the architecture. My favorite part was the winter room white when you walk in. There's this really pretty glass ceiling with wood with it. I loved that. We loved being on the grounds, being able to see the views, smell the flowers, loved hearing the history, loved and seeing the furniture, the design, and really primarily just hearing about the people that lived there. Getting to know them was my favorite part. In a lot of ways, what I want you to ask, what I want to ask you to do this morning is to go on a house tour with me. I don't know what your week has been, how stressful it has or hasn't been, but my guess is you wouldn't mind a little breather. So I want to invite you to sit back and enjoy a house tour with me. I want you to imagine what things would have looked like, what they would have sounded like, what they would have felt like, what they would have tasted like. I want you to take a breath and get to know the house and the person of the house. It all started when we were at the Biltmore House where they told us some background of how it was even built. George Vanderbilt visited this area in 1887. He liked the mountain views, he liked the milder climate, and he just wanted to build a house there. The history of the house that we are gonna talk about today I think is markedly more compelling and interesting. So I'd like to invite you to start in chapter 5, verse 1, and we are going to learn the background of this house that we are going to tour today. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram always loved David. And Solomon sent word to Hiram, You know that David my father could not build a house for the name of the Lord and his God, because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until the Lord put under them, put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. And so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to David my father, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in my place, shall build a house for my name. This is God's house. It is where God's presence will be. And to be honest, God and his presence is an incredibly significant theme all throughout the history of the nation of Israel and even back to the very creation. So I want to give you some scenes or snapshots of people's lives to remind us in the Old Testament how significant God's presence was. In the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve, it says that he walked with them in the garden. He was present with them. And when they sinned, they had their sin. God was holy, and they couldn't be in his presence and experience him in the same way. But yet God's presence with his people was incredibly significant. Think with me about the life of Moses. Moses was the one that God sent to lead his people out of Egypt. They had been enslaved there. And as Moses led them out, he made it very clear that God's presence was the most important part. God's presence would lead them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. In Exodus 33, we see that Moses builds a tent of meeting outside the camp. Why? Because that's where God's presence was and he was going to meet with God there. The pillar of cloud would descend upon that tent. Moses would meet with God face to face and the people would worship. 
when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. God descended in a pillar and stood with him. And while the people had sinned greatly, Moses made it very clear to the Lord, we cannot do this without you. We cannot do this without your presence. You absolutely have to be with us. And when Moses came down from the mountain, it says that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. They even constructed a tabernacle, which is a portable sanctuary that went with them as they traveled. That's where God's presence was. Some of the things we're going to read about today, the Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat, the Holy of Holies, that is where God's presence was. That was in the tabernacle. One final snapshot. After the people have reached the promised land and they have entered, we have a picture of David. David thinks, finally, we're here. We've gone through this long journey. It's time to build God a permanent house. And God says, not quite yet. I have a different plan. On your verse sheet, look at 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Instead, God promises David, I'm going to bring a future rest here. And there will be a building built, a house for me, but it's actually your son that's going to build it. And finally, we are here in 1 Kings. We have waited and waited, and it is time. The peace and the prosperity that we talked about last week in 1 Kings chapter 4 is the peace that had been promised. And God has kept his promises. He's brought peace in Israel, and he has put Solomon, David's son, in the place of building a temple And so as we see this temple, it is referencing us back to God's faithfulness over the years. God's promises, God's deliverance, God's presence over their years and years and years of struggle. They had been waiting and waiting for promises to be fulfilled. They had been waiting for a nation. They had been waiting for a land. They had been waiting for a temple. Lots of waiting. And finally, it's time. We're going to have this building and more than a building We're going to have a permanent place for the presence of God. The most important part of this is that God is going to be permanently with his people. Can you breathe that in? This is the history of the house. The history of God's presence is bringing us to a place where God is going to be with Israel. God with us. When we are at the Biltmore House, In addition to learning the background, there was a section of our tour that took us into some photos, some displays, some information about the actual building of the house, the people, the supplies that were necessary. It started with Mr. Vanderbilt by hiring architects so they could make a plan. They hired Richard Hunt, as well as a landscape architect named Frederick Law Olmsted, who you may have heard is the person that helped with New York City's Central Park. There were a whole lot of supplies that were gathered that were a part of bringing it in to the Biltmore House, national and international, about 10 million pounds of Indiana limestone, 38,000 bricks were were built on site every day. There was a lot of supplies and work that went into building the Biltmore House. And we are going to see a lot of supplies and a lot of workers that are a part of building God's house. Continue reading with me in verse 6 and watch how this happens. Now, therefore, command that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. There were not many appropriate large trees in Israel, so they needed to go elsewhere to get the wood for this building. And my servants will join your servants, and I will pay you for your servants such wages as you set. For you know that there's no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. The Sidonians lived near Tyre. As soon as Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, who's given to David a wise son to be over his great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I've heard the message that you have sent to me. I'm ready to do all you desire in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. My servants shall bring it down to the sea from Lebanon, and I will make it into rafts to go by sea to the place you direct. And I will have them broken up there, and you shall receive it. And you shall meet my wishes by providing food for my household." We're going to see a trade agreement occur here and watch what they're going to trade. Verse 
Verse 10, Hiram supplied Solomon with all the timber of cedar and the cypress that he desired. Verse 11 says what Solomon is going to give back. He gives to Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20,000 cores of beaten oil. Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon. The two of them made a treaty. Solomon uses his great wisdom to bring this trade partnership. He negotiates it with David's friend Hiram. And if you think about it, that's just for one of the items that's needed for the building of the temple. Solomon also had to procure a lot of necessary labor and supplies to build a house that is worthy of the Lord. Many more supplies and laborers are necessary. Verse 13 through 18, I'm just going to mention some of the workers, the laborers that were mentioned as a part of this project. There were transporters, hewers of stone, chief deputies, builders, and forced labor. There was a lot of work. My guess is that if you're like me, as you read that phrase, forced labor, it may bring some emotional angst, some concern, some awkwardness, because our country has a significant history with slavery. Forced labor is actually different than slavery, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute. But here's the reality. There was slavery in the Bible, and there were likely slaves that worked on this project. Certainly historical context and understanding what was going on is significant. Not all slavery in the Old Testament is like slavery that we experienced in our country. But really, there's no excuse or justification either way. It's, it's not okay. I just offer you hopefully today that we can be women who courageously fight slavery anywhere that we see it. And hopefully not hopefully, we have the promise of a heavenly home where there won't be any slavery. Anytime we read a story, a narrative text like this, we're always going to read about broken people doing some things that are inconsistent with God's design. And I think it's okay for us to sit with that for a moment and to grieve and acknowledge that. As I mentioned, some of the workers were slaves but forced laborers were not. Forced laborers were actually people that served for a temporary period of time on behalf of their country. They would have been drafted in to serve in this way, much like we would have people in our country that are drafted to serve in the military for a temporary period of time. We may be asked to serve as jurors for jury duty. Serving on behalf of your country for a temporary period of time was pretty common then, just as it is now. In addition to all these laborers, Solomon needed a lot of supplies. Some he gathered at this time, and some actually had been gathered beforehand. David actually got to be a part, not of building the temple, but of providing some supplies. In fact, God gave David the plan for the temple, which then he passed along to Solomon. And also, David was a part of gathering supplies. Look on your verse sheet at 1 Chronicles 29, verses 2 and 3. This is David speaking. He says, I've provided for the house of my God as far as I was able. The gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze the iron for the things of iron and wood for the things of wood, beside great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stones, and all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that, I've provided for the holy house. I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I've given it to the house of my God. David gave supplies. He also provided and asked for people in Israel who willingly wanted to give supplies, and they did. Think about this building project. I am genuinely in awe of all that it took to bring this about. Think with me for just a minute about all of what Hiram did in gathering wood. Think about the supply chain. Think about the transportation issues. Think about the skill required to bring this about. Tyre was about 100 miles northwest of Jerusalem, and so you would have to have people with the strength and the skill to cut down the timber. Then they would have to have the ingenuity and strength to bring it over to the sea. 
Then they would have to have the skill to put together ropes, but rafts that would actually be able to float down the river. Then they'd have to arrive at somewhere near Jerusalem where they could take them out. Then they would have to take them apart. Then they would have to carry them over to Jerusalem where then they could be cut into planks to put in the temple. And that's just for one supply. No cell phones to check in and see how it's going. No clicking on Amazon to find out when the delivery truck is going to be there. No running over like I do for what I forgot to Walmart or Home Depot. This is a massive project. Think about even all the people required and all the coordination of all the people. Someone had to get those craftsmen, get their skills in the right place, feed them, encourage them, figure out what was going on. This is a massive, massive project. And God uses his image bearers to bring it about. Whether it was someone who was paid to work there, whether they were a forced laborer, whether they were a slave, all of them bore God's image. And we see God's image in their creativity. We see it in their ingenuity. We see it in their strength. We see it in their dominion. God's image bearers are doing this work, and I think it's really beautiful. We're going to move into chapter 6, and we are going to begin to read and look at some of these very clear plans of what the temple is supposed to look like. It is not just gathering supplies, but we are going to build. Read with me verse 1 in chapter 6. In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. The building of the temple is supposed to evoke memories of 480 years earlier when Israel left Egypt, when they exited. We're supposed to remember that. 480 years, some think is a literal number, some think it is symbolic based on the number of generations that have passed since then. But either way, we are supposed to mark this building with the Exodus. We're supposed to remember that God's peoples were enslaved. We're supposed to remember that he brought them out. We're supposed to remember that they wandered in the wilderness. We're supposed to remember that they finally got to enter the promised land. We're supposed to remember the fighting and the wars that it took for them to live there. We're supposed to remember that they settled there. We're supposed to remember that they are now living in peace. We are supposed to remember that all of this happened and that God was present with them. We're supposed to remember the promises of God and all that has occurred and that he has been the key part of this entire thing. In Exodus, on your verse sheet, verses 17, uh, verse, chapter 15, verses 17 and 18, it's a callback to right after God had brought his people out of Egypt, he had miraculously parted the Red Sea, and they had gone through. And Moses and his people are singing a song of worship, and they sing this. You, speaking about God, will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord will reign forever and forever. It's finally time to build. So they build on Mount Moriah. It has the same layout the temple does as the tabernacle did. There are no archaeological remains currently existing today that we know of from Solomon's temple. It was destroyed when Babylon took over Jerusalem. Herod's temple was later built in this very same spot, and there are some archaeological remnants from that temple. I want us to think and try to put ourselves in the temple for a minute, so I'm going to ask you to pull out that illustration, that design of the temple, and I'm going to do something. I'm going to remind you kind of in order um, what different things are introduced in those first nine verses. But what I want you to do is I want you to be looking at that map and I want you to be imagining what it would look like, okay? Little background, a cubit is about 18 inches. I'm not gonna remember that and so I'm gonna translate it into feet and yards for you as you imagine being there. Also, just for reference, an average bedroom size is about 11 foot by 12 foot. So if you're not good at imagining things, just use that as your reference, okay? So I want you to look at the illustration and I want you to imagine 
what the scripture is describing to us in the first nine verses of chapter six. One, the overall size of the house. I want you to imagine it was about 90 feet long, which is about 30 yards. Imagine 30 yards on a football field. Then imagine width-wise, it's about 30 feet wide, which is about 10 yards, and it's about 45 feet high. So it is higher and longer than it is wider, okay? See if you can put yourself in that. Verse 3 talks about the porch or the vestibule. That's out front. Of course, it's 30 feet wide, but it's also about 15 feet deep. That's what it tells us about in verse 3. In verse 4, it mentions the windows with recessed frames. So I want you to glance up at those. Imagine the light coming in those windows. Verse 5 starts talking about the different stories that were built around the walls of the nave and the inner sanctuary. The nave is that part that is in the middle, the holy place. It's a large portion of the temple. It was 20 yards long and again, 10 yards wide. See if you can imagine that. And then in the inner sanctuary at the back where the most holy place is, it's a 30 by 30 foot cube. Okay, try to imagine this. And then in the nave, in that middle part, we see the golden altar of incense, golden table for the bread of the presence, 10 golden lampstands, five on the north, five on the south. And then there are designs engraved in the walls. You can kind of see maybe what that representation was. As we go to verse 6, it's going to describe the three stories of the house. There are those three stories around the edge. The lowest story was seven and a half feet wide. The middle one was nine feet wide. And the upper chamber was ten and a half feet wide. And there would have been a door on the right on the south side. And that is how you would have moved up from the lower floor to the middle floor to the third Okay, you can kind of look up from that if you want to for a minute. Um, some of your designers, your architects, your brain works like that. That was super easy to imagine. I have absolutely none of that skill. I, don't, I am not good at any of the things required in planning or building a building. In the summers when I was in high school, I would spend a week helping really build needy people's homes. And one year I was up on the roof helping roof, and I'm stubborn, so I'll try anything. But I remember when they first were like, hey, anyone can roof. You can't really really bend a roofing nail. They're just too hard to bend. And I'm like, well, you have not met me. So without trying, I bent multiple roofing nails. And I remember the man thinking, how is she doing this? And I'm like, I'm just bad at it. No, I'm stubborn and I'll keep going, but I'm not good at this. And so I was afraid that I wouldn't grasp all of this or the joy of this. So I actually thought, who is a friend of mine who likes to build and design things? And I actually called her and I said, will you do me a favor? Will you read verses, chapters five and six, and will you tell me what you see? Because she enjoys this. She enjoys the plans, she enjoys the design, and it makes a whole lot of sense to her. So she sent me a Marco Polo at my request because I'm not an auditory learner and I wanted to listen to it multiple times. If you're not familiar with Marco Polo, it's an app on your phone where she videoed herself talking in her house, and then I was able to access the app and listen to her. So she talked to me for 20 minutes. I joked with her that I was going to play her for 20 minutes today, and that I was going to talk for 20 minutes. We're not doing that, but I did tell her I was going to do that. I was joking. But I want to mix a few of my thoughts, but mainly hers, and I want you to hear her heart and her excitement about the building. She talked about what it felt like, what it may have sounded like being there, what it looked like. She got really excited about the measurements. She was the one that trans translated, did the math from cubits to feet and yards because she was really excited about it. She talked about how very important those measurements would have been. Think about the cornerstone. Think about the measurements in the corner of a house to make sure that the floors and the walls and the ceilings all fit together. She loves stuff like that. She's really excited. She talked about the stone on the outside because the entire temple was with stone. And I could see her being like, that would have been really hard to get all that stone there. And that would have been really heavy. Can you imagine the texture of the stone on the outside of the temple, that roughness? She probably got most excited talking about the wood because she loves wood. She actually took her video camera with her and showed me some of the wood in her house because she got really excited talking about cedar. Apparently, it smells really delightful, and so it would have smelled the smell of the cedar as they're building. She talked about how pretty cedar is, the design that's in the cedar. 
Can you imagine be working on that seder, maybe slowly rub your hand down that design? Consider the position that it would have taken to make the planks exactly right so they would line up along the walls, along the floors, that the entire thing would be covered in wood, done very well. There would have been no electrical power. She also was mesmerized by verse 7, where it talked about there was a hammer, axe, iron tool, nothing was heard in the house while it was being built. Can you imagine how quiet, relative to other construction sites, this construction site would have sounded? Can you kind of put yourself there and hear some muted sound? And then she talked about the gold. There was gold literally over every part of the temple over the engravings, over the walls, over the ceiling, over the altars, over the floor, over everything. She looked up and said, quite possibly, there were 34 tons of gold used. She said, can you imagine, like, could you, would you have had to squint in there? Could you have even looked? Can you imagine the light coming in those windows and maybe bouncing off the gold? And as she ended her Marco Polo with me, she said something, and she wasn't intending for it to be a quote, so I'm going to kind of just read it to you like C. Red, because she's been really excited and mesmerized by the whole thing. And she ends it this way. She says, now I'm thinking about the temple, how only the high priest would have gotten to see some of that stuff. The high priest is the only one that would have gone back into the most holy place. She said, but that mattered to the workers anyway. To design it that way, to make it beautiful that way, no human's going to see some of it. Some of that wood was totally covered and no one ever saw it. But here's my favorite part. She says, but God will dwell there and he knows what they used and he knows how they did it. He's going to see it and he's worthy of that. And she looks up at the end with this big smile on her face and she says, so that makes it really cool to me. Verse 9 says that Solomon built the house and he finished it. The detailed plans for the temple are mirroring God's perfect completion of every plan he makes. Read with me verses 12 and 13. Concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to, your, to David, your father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people. The Lord called Solomon and his people to live in obedience as he dwelled with them. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But I want you to think about how obedience is connected to dwelling with and experiencing God's presence. When we were at the Biltmore House, I told you that my favorite part was kind of getting to learn about the people that lived there. So as we walked through the rooms, you saw the type of furniture they chose, what types of rooms that they built in their house, what the design and the core, what decor was, and I began to learn what they valued and what they liked, what kind of made their heart beat fast, what they loved. One of the things that Mr. Vanderbilt loved was art. He was an art collector. In fact, they showed us one piece of art that he had bought right before he died unexpectedly, and they pointed out that he'd bought it, but it hadn't yet been delivered to the house. So he had never gotten to see this piece of art in the house. In fact, the Biltmore House was so connected with art that in World War II, they were, National Gallery of Art was afraid as to what was gonna happen with the war and what would happen, and they were afraid that all of the art might be destroyed, and so they actually asked for some paintings and sculptures to be stored at the Biltmore House out of the way, and it was, just in case something was going to happen. This was a place of art. Mr. Vanderbilt loved art. He also loved hospitality. We heard stories and stories and stories about people that visited there, how he loved having people in. We saw how he put the rooms together for people to gather. We saw the guest house. What went on in this house told us some very significant things about Mr. Vanderbilt. And as we move into this next section, I want you to begin to think about what we are learning about the person of the temple. What are we learning about God as we walk through the temple? Because his glory, majesty, and holiness are echoing throughout the temple's design and its decor. There's a lot in these last verses. We can't look in grand detail at every piece of it. So I have chosen one I want us to look at, and this is the cherubim. 
So I'm going to read for you verses 23 through 29. Think about these angels. In the inner sanctuary, in the most holy place, that place at the back, he made two cherubim of olive wood. Each were 10 cubits high. That's 15 feet. These cherubim were 15 feet high. Five cubits was the length of one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the length of the other wing of the cherub. It was 10 cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. The other cherub also measured 10 cubits. Both cherubim had the same measure in the same form. The height of one cherub was 10 cubits, and so was that of the other cherub. He put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house, and the wings of the cherubim were spread out, so that a wing of one touched the one wall, and a wing of the other cherub touched the other wall. And their wings touched each other in the middle of the house. So that means you've got this 30-foot room, You've got one wing of one cherub touching this wall. Then their wings touch in the middle. And then you have another wing that's touching the other wall, okay? Spanning the entire room. And then verse 28 tells us, and he overlaid the cherubim with gold. Around all the walls of the house, he carved engraved figures of the cherubim and palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. Cherubim were a significant part of the temple, and frankly, we've seen them throughout the Old Testament. They often were protecting, they were serving, and they were all regularly associated with God's presence. There was a cherub in the Garden of Eden that guarded the way to the tree of life. Multiple times in the scriptures, we read how God is described as the one who is enthroned about or above the cherubim. God is present in the temple, and it is telling us something about him. Think with me about what we've learned and how that being true of God and present with us matters. Think with me about the plan, the great care and intention that went into building the temple. Quite often, I feel like my life is messy and there's not a plan, or at least not someone who knows the plan, because I don't always know what's going on. But if God is present with me, There's always someone with a plan who knows what's going on and has great care and intention in bringing his plans to completion. We learned about all of this stone around the outside of the temple, how sturdy and solid and strong that was. I often feel weak. And the fact that I have a God present with me who is strong is incredibly comforting to me. And can you imagine the gold, all all of the gold, everywhere, ceilings, floors, altars, engravings, everywhere. God is not boring or blah in any way. (laughs) He is the most majestic, glorious, not boring person you have ever met in your life. And imagine for me the most holy place. There is holiness all throughout this temple. When Isaiah had a vision of the Lord later on, and it talked about the angels were there with him, or flying around his vision of the Lord, and it talked about the train of the robe, or his robe, God's robe, is filling the temple. Can you imagine in your mind right now that vision that Isaiah might have had just the robe that's filling the temple. And the angels are covering their eyes, they're covering their fleet, and they are going around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is holy. Walk with me for a minute back into the holy of holies, back to the most holy place at the back. It's a 30 by 30 foot cube, and it is laden with gold. It is particularly connected with the presence of God There is a thick veil that is protecting the people from the holiness of God that is covering the most holy place from the rest of the temple. There's one and only one piece of furniture there. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And it's the mercy seat, which is the covering for that Ark. No human is allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant and live. Years before this, as I had tried and he had died, it is too holy for us. Once a year, and only once a year on the Day of Atonement, only one person is able to enter that place, and it's the high priest. Can you imagine him putting on his priestly garments? They would have been perhaps brilliant. 
He walks by the people, he walks into the temple, and he and he alone walks back into the most holy place. And underneath those 15 feet cherubim, he takes the blood of a sacrifice, an animal, and he sprinkles it on the Ark of the Covenant. For God is holy, and there has to be punishment for sin. There has to be a consequence for sin. And until that is forgiven and made right, entering into the presence of God in that way is not okay. And then the priest turns And he's able to walk back out through the temple, back out through the people, and he is alive. The most holy place highlights the sacrifices necessary to actually enjoy God's presence. Years previous to this, there had been a father named Abraham, the father of this nation, and he had walked his son up that mountain, willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. This is the very same place on the very same mountain that we see the temple. And years previously, at the last minute, God said, I'm not going to require your son. There has to be a sacrifice for sin, for I am holy, and it has to be punished. But I'm going to provide an animal instead. And here in the holy place, we still see the most holy place in this very same place, sacrifices and animal blood being offered for a holy God for the sins of the people. And years later, there's going to be a father who's going to be willing to offer his son. But at the last minute, there's not going to be an exchange of an animal. For the father God is going to be willing to offer his son as a sacrifice for sin. And there's not going to be another animal that's going to stand in its place. But there's going to be the Savior, Jesus Christ, who is going to offer his body as a sacrifice for sin. Read with me Hebrews 9, 24 to 26 and verse 28. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year, with blood not his own. Jesus is going to go into this place, not multiple times, but only once. Multiple animals had been offered for years, but Jesus only goes once. For then he would have had to repeatedly suffer since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. In that moment, Jesus goes once, and no animal sacrifices would be required after that. And in Jesus' death, that very thick veil that had had to protect us from the holiness of God because we could not tolerate him because a sacrifice has to be offered, That veil is ripped. And forevermore, anyone in Christ can walk past that veil into the Holy of Holies and experience the presence of God. I know we talk about the holiness of the temple, and I know we talk about the majesty and the glory, and it is all there. But do you understand that God designed a temple? He designed a house to make it possible that we could go into it. His mercy and grace are in every breath and every detail of that temple. He makes a way so that we can go in. I can hardly talk about it without sobbing. When Solomon is asked by the Lord to obey so that God can dwell with him, do you understand that God is asking Solomon to obey so he can experience more of God's presence? We sometimes think of obedience as this hard, dutiful, rigid thing, and sometimes it is, but do you understand why God asks us to obey? He asks us to obey so we can experience more and more of his presence. It's the pure in heart that get to see God. He wants us to obey so we can taste and marvel in who he is. We should be scouring the scriptures for every small thing we can obey because we are dying to experience more of the presence of God. 
we get to marvel in and enjoy God's presence. Can you believe that we get to do that? We get to look forward to a day, a heavenly home, where the glory of God is going to be absolutely unveiled to us in a perfect way that we have yet to experience. This is the temple. This is the presence of God. This is the God present with you. Pray with me. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Merciful, gracious, you are breathtakingly beautiful. I pray that we would be women, Lord, who obey. Would you draw us to obedience? Would you enable us to experience and marvel in your presence? Because you are the most beautiful person that we will ever meet. Jesus, what you did for us, for me, it's just hard to even talk about. Praise to you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.